thanks. Well, um, I didn't have a slide to talk about me, so I'll use just words. So I am Miguel Rojas. I am a cloud architect uh, for the EMEA region. Uh, before joining this company, I was working as a solution architect for Red Hat. So containers and, and I were tied together. Uh, I saw customers going from small projects to huge projects in the EMEA region. So I'm kind of familiar with Kubernetes and some of the pains, right? And, and the reason I'm here and I'm in this company is because I, I, I come from Red Hat, but also because I know about Kubernetes. And, you know, pure storage for me was challenging because, I mean, it's a hardware company and then you come from software, it's like, oh my God, am I going to join a company full of dinosaurs? So in, these, in this case, that's not true. Well, in some cases, uh, I'll give you details later with the beer. But um, that's the reason I joined this company. And I'll give you a little bit of history. Um, Portworks and Kubernetes were kind of created at the same time. Forward started with Docker. You know, Docker was not as successful as Kubernetes is nowadays. So uh, we started at the same time. Basically, they wanted to do an SDS, so software-defined storage for Kubernetes environments. And nowadays, they, we have plenty of customers. We have evolved our product, and I'll give you more details in the next slides. Okay. So um, I, I like these graphics because you know they show stuff, but. Uh, what, what I mean with this slide is basically everybody at the moment, every company that's in every uh, index in the stock market is using Kubernetes. You can JP Morgan, you can talk about you know, Lufthansa, any German company that you think about that's big, they're using Kubernetes, and this is just a reality, okay? Um, when companies, nowadays, when companies realize that Kubernetes is not only having the best Kubernetes distribution, they have more challenges. They, they expect tools to behave the same way Kubernetes does, and that's not true, right? And one of the biggest challenges is storage and data management, okay? So, some, oh, sorry about that. So how some vendors have achieved this and like they've tried to give solutions to these problems is by creating connectors, right? Like a CSI. CSI was born three years ago, but was born six years ago. So, you know, CSI, I guess everybody. By the way, who in the room uses Kubernetes every day? Can you raise your hand, please? Like production, come on, don't be shy. Just let me know. So I'm, ask, I'm asking these because I, some topics I'm going to talk about later are kind of technical and I need to understand if this is going to land or not. So how companies, vendors are doing it, they, they are using, the, do you want to use my storage for your community's environments? Okay, I'll give you a connector. But these comes, it gives challenges like one-to-one. -one. It's like a direct attach. Uh, the way of using storage kind of limits. And when you are developing an application, the last thing you want is the environment to restrict you. You want to be able to use the storage that you want anywhere. And you want these attributes. Because I mean, Kubernetes gives you optimized multi-cloud world. And I mean, this sounds very marketing. But in the end, what, you, what this means is you're using today EKS. And tomorrow, your company, your CEO is like, oh, but I want to use OpenShift because um, they give me a huge discount. Well, move your application, right? It's very easy. It's container. Every Kubernetes distribution is going to understand it. And this is just one example of what Kubernetes is about. So because there are not with CSI, you don't achieve these. Boardworks came to the rescue. In the end, what we want to achieve here is that you are able to do any application in any Kubernetes distribution. So as I said before, OpenShift, Amazon, GKE, Anthos, Tansu, and in any cloud, any infrastructure, every stage. This is a solution that's totally agnostic. When I say agnostic, it means that it's not tied to a specific provider. And what it's trying to achieve, uh, how we started, it was just an SDS layer, OK? It was just an SDS layer with PX Store. But then they realized there are more challenges. The CEO of the company realized, OK, but people really care about backup. And it's just a recovery, a migration, and security, and autopilot, and data services. So I'll explain what this is in a minute. Oop, sorry, there you go. Backup, I think it's pretty self-explanatory. So how Portworx Backup works, it takes a copy of your namespace. Every CRD under that namespace is going to be backed up in an S3 bucket, and you're going to be able to move that data to any Kubernetes distribution that you want. 
and then disaster recovery. The way it powers that disaster recovery is, this is uh, for namespaces, okay? So imagine you're running today your Kubernetes application in Paris, and, but you have another data center in the US because you're a total cloud. Or maybe it's a private cloud, you name it, right? You want to have full disaster recovery. So how we do it, we do migrations. We call it migrations. We're going to migrate data with the time range that you choose, so five minutes, every hour, and then you are going to have a active, passive type of architecture. And once you activate this recovery, because, you know, uh, maybe a new graduate did, I don't know, RM uh, slash RF, and it's gone, your whole cluster, well, don't worry about it. Disaster recovery powers going to help you. And then powers migrate is one of the demos I'm going to do. Today I'm going to do two demos if I have enough time. I'm going to do a backup of a whole namespace from cluster to cluster, and then I'm going to migrate one whole namespace from one cluster to another total independent. And you're going to see that because, I mean, it's great that I talk about it, but what if I can show you, right? And then security, well, we amplify the Kubernetes security features. We basically integrate Commbold or the, all of these secret managers into Kubernetes, and you're able to provide secrets, and only this user with this secret will be able to access that PVC, okay? And then autopilot, this is great. It's easy to understand with a clear example of Black Friday. Uh, you go from 3,000 requests for the same application to 3 million, sorry about that. You suddenly want someone that's going to resize your volume. Poor works communicates with Prometheus, and then you provide flags to that PVC, and you say, okay, this PVC, 80% for me is full. If it reaches 81%, raise 10 gigabytes, right? This is just an example. But these are the great use cases. When would you use these solutions? What I see in customers uh, is that they, when they have all these applications in Kubernetes, they don't realize they need all these features. They need to take care of the data, right? And then it's not customers and me talking about it. Giga Om, so these, you know, one of these fancy companies that do reports, he, they have chosen us three times in a row, so three years, as the cloud native data storage leader and the enterprise community storage leader for three years. Okay. Uh, a little bit more technical. I'll stop with the marketing now. So, app and data migration. This is exactly what we're going to see today. I'm going to migrate one whole application for Kubernetes one. It, everything is running in AWS. I'll show you my instances running. Every, so I'm going to migrate my namespace from cluster one to the cluster two. And then I'm also going to do a backup. So this is how it works. I wanted to show you in graphics how it works. So every CRD under that namespace is going to be backed up in an S3 bucket. That's mine, right? It's my, in my account. And I'm going to move that, restore that whole namespace with the data of the application in another cluster, and you're going to see it, okay? And then one of the things that I've seen in customers, like, you know, big telcos, I'm talking with a couple of them in EMEA, is that, you know, when you join, bring the solution into the company, some people get sensitive. Oh, you are going to take my job because I'm a backup person. Uh, and then if you, in, you put this into the stack, I'm going to lose my job because I'm not relevant anymore. Well, that's not true, because with Boros Backup, every role in the company, every developer, app owner, or admin, they have their own capabilities within this tool, okay? So an app owner would be in charge of namespace, A, M, B, and set schedule, set rules, use ex existing cloud accounts, and be kind of the uh, manager, right? This is just an example, again. Um, I will answer questions later, because I think we're going to be kind of tight in time. but. Happy to answer. Oppa. Uh, this is how this is installed, okay? Portworx is installed as an operator. It runs, it's a pod by every node within your cluster. So you do kubectl get pods in every namespace, and you're going to see one Portworx pod running by every node, node. The requirement is three nodes and one master. And it runs as an operator. That's the reason it's agnostic. Operators are understood in every Kubernetes distribution. And how this works is it's going to create this storage pool. I'll, I'll also show you this. It's going to create a storage pool of, 
of all your S SSDs or every NVMe or every Loon you have, you have basically attached or connected to that worker. It's going to create this storage pool and then every PVC, so every application that needs data, is going to take data from that storage pool. So if you have 50 gigabytes by every node, you'll have 150 gigabytes in that storage pool. Okay, and then every application, this makes HA easy, for example, if one of your nodes goes down, as um, Powers is going to realize, right? And the replication gets easier and easier. This is, this is basically what I was explaining, but with graphics, okay? You have replication three, and one of your nodes goes down, you're going to be able to, well, you have two nodes still available, but Powerworks will bring the data and the application to an existing node in the cluster without you caring about it. I was having a chat with someone at lunch and he was telling me, you know, when, I, when one of my Postgres applications goes down, I, I lose the data. I don't know how to recover my data when my Postgres application goes down. I just recovered a pod. Well, Powerworks IntelliJ is able to bring the data and the pod to a new existing and a live node. So you don't have to worry about, oh, how am I gonna copy the data manually? You know, I mean, the previous presenter was talking about automation. This is key for developers, right, Mickey? So deployment models, basic, okay? Minimum three nodes, a block storage device, happy days. And then for cloud environments, like ACs are, are, are a thing, right? So every th you have, for example, three ACs in Paris, one, two, three, for example, and you deploy your Powerworks uh, storage cluster, and it's gonna take your nodes spread around every, all the Paris data center and create this storage pool, right? This is another. And then this aggregated computer storage. So imagine you are a company that wants to innovate. You have storage in your data center, but you want to use the workloads in the cloud. Well, that requires a lot of investment because if you need to pay storage in two places, that's double the price. Okay, why don't you use your storage in your data center and work with your applications in the cloud? With Powerworks, you can do that. I wanted to do a case study before jumping into the demo. Uh, I think T-Mobile is understood everywhere. Uh, in this case, we talked with the American T-Mobile, but they, they had a clear challenge. You know, Every time Apple would deliver a new iPhone, the number of requests by, in their website would grow from 10,000 to millions. Obviously, everybody wants the new app, Apple device, and that creates more requests. So they needed, they used Powerworks Enterprise in their data centers, in this case, on-premises, to fix that problem. They were able to do regular withstands The launch of an Apple product results in dramatic spikes of usage, meaning they were able to face these challenges without all these engineers put to work just to check that everything is working fine, okay? So I think I'm gonna go for the demo factor. As I said before, I've deployed um, both Powerworks migrate. Well, in the end, by the way, this is just one operator. Everything is, everything is going to be working. You don't need to do install extra PCs or anything else. Just this operator. I just wanted. To, I have this my AWS uh, dashboard here, so you knew that I'm not lying. Everything is. This is Kubernetes vanilla running in virtual instances in, in AWS. Okay. So I'm going to connect. To I, I close the session because. I, the internet in this hotel is kind of flaky, so run password. Okay, good. So I've named my sessions here. You have cluster one and cluster two. Uh, if I do kubectl get my namespaces, you see that here in my um, cluster. Oh wait. I'm still in the same, I'm gonna do it. Awesome. Now if I do the same command, so kubectl get, I'm, I've, by the way, I have k as an alias for kubectl. So you see here, my namespaces, in this case I have an extra one that's called Pet Clinic. It's a very basic Java app that has a database running. I'll show you what's behind it.
Awesome. So you see we have my pod, you know the application is running, my SQL database is also running. And this, that's, this is just a web, a web page, right? It's just with its database. So what I'm going to do now, I'm going to migrate from cluster one to cluster two. How am I going to do that? I'm going to use Stork. Stork is the open source project that's inside works. This is the Kubernetes is the scheduler for containers. Stork is the scheduler for data for Kubernetes. So they actually, uh, and both are open source projects. You can check it on GitHub. Uh, so how is this done? If this is obviously Kubernetes equals YAML file, this is a YAML file that you apply to your Kubernetes cluster. So I'll show you that YAML file. In this case, this is the project I was talking about, Stork. Right? What kind of YAML is this one? It's a migration YAML file. In this case, I'm going to call this migration app migration in the namespace cube system. And this is a magic word that I didn't mention before, which is cluster pair. This is the piece, the software piece that we use to communicate clusters, like the handshake, you know? The handshake between clusters so they see each other. Obviously, network and connectivity is required. We don't do magic. but this is the piece that we use to communicate clusters. In this case, I've called it remote cluster, so it's easy to understand. Do I want to include the resources under that namespace? Yes. So, true. And do I want to start the applications? Also true. If this was disaster recovery, I would say false, because I want active passive. And what namespace do you want to migrate, Miguel? In this case, I've selected just pet clinic, but I could, I could add thousand, you know, a list of new namespaces here, another namespace, and this would just be one YAML file. So I'm gonna exit, and I'm gonna apply. But before applying, I'm gonna do a watch here. Great, so everything happens, and you see it. So I'm just gonna apply this. Awesome, something's happened. So let's see, a stork comes with its own CLI, CLI. Maybe I just do, I get migrations. There you go. There's some migration happening, but still, let's see it with more detail. Stork, CTL, get me. There you go. Okay, so something's happening. I'm actually gonna just watch this command so we see it live. Okay, so as you can see here, something's happening, right? There is in progress a migration, zero bytes transfers transferred, but it's trying to migrate some resources, right? You see a volume that wants to be migrated. Let's see what happens. Let's give it some time. In the meantime, oh, in progress, something, oh, there you go. Hey, this a new namespace has been created automatically in my cluster number two, six seconds ago. So it's gonna move my everything. Right, every CRD under that namespace successfully was successfully migrated, as you can see here. But what I'm gonna do here, I'm gonna just show you. Right, we love fat, uh, fact checking, so let's do a Control C, and I'm gonna broadcast to both clusters and do Control C again, and do kubectl get all PVCs namespace bed clinic. Okay. So comparison one to one, we see the same CRDs in cluster one and in cluster two. It took me two, five minutes to show you. Obviously, it, as, uh, if your network system is very complicated, it's gonna take some time to set up, but this is a reality I'm, I just showed you, right? This is not something that the market is saying, that the customers are saying, but you as technical people can see it. But then I'm gonna do also the, um, the Powers Backup demo. So the Powers Backup in this case comes with a um, user interface. You can add as many clusters as possible here as you want, but you can do many things, like schedule policies. This is also pretty self-explanatory, but I'll show you though. So 
you can create a schedule for your backup every day, every, uh, every week. Uh, let's call it test and it's type, you know, daily for example. Every day at 1 a.m. Retain seven copies in criminal count of six. You can also tweak and change that. Let's create this one. So you see it in the example. And I'm going to go to my, for example, my cluster two. I have another window here. Okay. This is the one. I'm going to do the same. Connect to my clusters. Great. Awesome. So I'll do the same. I'll do kubectl get namespaces. Same. In this case, I'm going to use pet clinic, but in, in this demo, I'm going to show you pet clinic. Okay. So if I go to my cluster number one, to my, I think it's in master one. Yes. Thanks. I forgot to do this before the demo. Oh, this is it. Yeah. Okay, if I copy this address and I paste it here with the poor, should be able to access the. Nope. Maybe it's in cluster number two. Yeah, it's in cluster number two. Okay, let's shut, let's go to master two. Master two. You see, it's in backup. Yep. Okay, copy. There you go. This is my application, okay? Very basic, right? Database, web page, find owners, right? Very basic. Database connected MySQL. So just for the purpose of the demo, for the sake of the demo, I'm going to add some data. Okay, my name is Miguel Rojas, Madrid, Madrid, and this is my fake phone number. If I add it, if I go to find owners and find one, there you go. I'm here. I just appeared. Why did I do that? Because I'm going to move these. How am I going to do that? I'm just going to do a backup. As I said before, the backups are stored in an S3 bucket. So that's, this is what I did. If I go to cloud settings, I have my account. This could be an Azure account, a Minio account, a, you know, any of these providers. So it could be private cloud or, or, or public, public cloud. And then backup location, so my bucket, right? I gave, I add my bucket here, and I do, you know, name, cloud account in this case, right? This makes sense. I'm gonna go back, I'm gonna go back to my cluster. So if I go to cluster two, I've, you've seen, you've seen the, the namespace. I'm just gonna put this here, okay? And put this here. So we see both things at the same time. I'm gonna clear the screen pretty there. Okay. And Pet Clinic, right? This is the namespace that you I showed you. This is the application that you were seeing. So let's see what is behind this pet this namespace. If I do select resources, poor works, backup, it's gonna be able to read what's behind that namespace. So you see my deployments, my persistent volume claim, and my services. The service has the port 3333. This is what we're seeing now. So let's do a backup of this application. If I do backup, and I name it stack.com, for example, my backup location is it's gonna be my AWS account. And I'm, I'm gonna do it now, because I don't wanna wait until 1 a.m., but I could select my test a scheduled policy that I created right now, okay? Then these are two features that I like, so post-exec and pre-exec rules, so you wanna do a flash of your database before the, the, and before the backup, so you just select the rule that you can create. The, inter, the internet is full of templates for pre- and post-exec rules, right? So I'm just gonna do create, okay? And my backup is gonna be created in a couple seconds, uh, maybe a minute. Right. I'm sure it's already done. Nope. Let's give it a second. In the meantime, what I'm going to do here, I'm just going to do a watch. Why do I do that? Because of, because of what I did before. 
I want you guys to see that the recovery or the restore of this backup that I'm doing at the moment is working. Okay, maybe I need to give it more time. Cluster two. Oh, maybe it's the, the internet. That's not, okay. Uh. What if I name it differently? Let's do, because this morning I called it stack, the same name, so test backup. And now in my S3 bucket, I'm gonna do the same, great. Okay, maybe this one works, maybe it doesn't, I hope it does. I think the internet is playing with me because the internet connection is not really fine. Let's see if it works. So my intention here is to go to migrate this namespace that you, can, that you see here, and we're gonna restore it in my cluster number three, okay, so you guys can see it. Let's give it more time. Honestly, this morning I tested this environment, and it took me one minute to do this. So, I don't know. Maybe it's a good time to ask questions. Any question in the audience? Go ahead. Um, can you say a little bit about uh, data consistency across distributed applications? Yeah, uh, what do you want to know? That's a very right, big topic. In this case, Poreworks um, is able to do, if you, consistency, what's, what's that for you? What, what do you mean? What, what's, what's your pain? system after mm -hmm. stopping transactions, uh, making sure that in a distributed environment yep. all the systems and all their data are mm -hmm. in sync yep. with regard to the point of time that you take the backup or mm -hmm. the freeze the snapshot and then you can take whatever hours to copy all that away yep. and then when you restore it and start the system you have a fairly high chance that it will start off in a consistent state. Right. If you don't do that, but go like, you know, system by system and data store by data store mm -hmm. and create a backup, then you can be guaranteed that this is not consistent across mm -hmm. the entire application landscape. Right, right, that's a good point. And in this case, uh, oh, the, backups are, the backup are ready. Uh, so in this case, this is working with an S3 bucket. You're sending the copy of your data to that S3 bucket. So, and this works with uh, NFS and block. So I mean consistency, if you're doing the backup at 3 a.m. every day and you're worried, oh, this data is not what I want to recover. Well, you choose the copy that you want to recover. In this case, if you want this, you know, golden copy that you, or golden backup, you can always choose from that golden backup and recover, restore uh, the data in your cluster. Is that what you were asking? Oh, okay. I'm talking about the source side. Yeah. Like I have five microservices that have five databases and they talk to each other via queues and, mm. and REST calls. I see. So how do I ensure that this network of applications mm -hmm. actually can be backed up in a consistent state? Meaning I take, I take a backup of all mm -hmm. of them at exactly the same time. Mm -hmm. Ideally, after giving them a moment to pause transactions, mm -hmm. meaning that ongoing transactions are completed, new transactions are started. Mm. I don't know, like, you know, I'm a bit older, so in the good <laughs> days, like, <laughs> there, there was this thing like, you know, LDM snapshots, freezing the database, taking a snapshot, continuing the database, right. taking time to back up from the snapshot, mm -hmm. throwing away the snapshot, and all that complexity. Mm -hmm that we did in order to have actually consistent backups. Mm. And in the era of Kubernetes and distributed applications, these problems didn't go away. They just became more complex as they now cover because more services and yeah. the service that we can orchestrate. Yes, but do you mind if I conclude the demo and we come back to the topic? Sure. Yeah, thank you. Can you ask for a question? No, 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 honestly, I, every question is welcome. If I don't know the answer, I can always learn. So I don't, I don't mind tough questions. So let's restore these with a name, I don't know, Pet, Pet Clinic 1. 
This nation is going to be, so by the way, kind of coming back to your question, if you uh, have a copy that, or your new application rollout is not working very well, and you know, <coughs> sorry, and you know that this golden copy that you have created works, you can always restore this namespace in the same cluster and do replace existing resources, right? So let's call it custom resource because I want to change the namespace name so it's named differently and it's cooler. So let's call it pet clinic stack, okay? And what do you want to uh, restore? I want to restore the deployment, persistent volume claim, and services, everything into this new cluster, okay? So I'm going to select cluster three and hit restore. In a second, we should see another, there you go, three seconds ago, this namespace has been created and we should expect this data to be consistent, right? So as I added my name, Miguel Rojas, into the list of uh, pet owners, even though I don't own any pet, it should be here. So I'm gonna try to get the URL of the master number three. That should be this one, if I'm not mistaken. Yes. If I copy this and I add the same port, maybe my application is not still alive. That's how it looks like. Let's actually stop this and check what's happening. Okay. Yep. My application is still starting, so let's give it more time. Uh, in this case, um, uh, can I, sorry, what's your name? Slamo. Miguel, nice to meet you. So um, application and data consistency is something that a lot of companies care about nowadays, right? Because in the end, you are talking about distributed systems, many applications, many PVCs in the case of Kubernetes. So, how do you, how do you, uh, I guess your question was, how do you provide a consistent data store that's whenever I want to back up something and I restore it, it's the same for all my applications that are running Kubernetes and they talk to each other, right? All these applications with, I guess, RabbitMQ or any queue manager. So um, how this works, you know, Kubernetes is namespaces. All the applications are deployed in namespaces. If your namespace has the right data, when you restore the data and you're able to see, as you are seeing right now in this example, you, the data that was in cluster one is now in cluster two. So the moment, obviously, if the data was backed up five minutes ago, that's the data that you're gonna have five minutes ago. If you do backups and restores uh, every two hours, you're gonna have the data that was backed up two hours ago, right? Is that, does that answer your question? No? Okay, maybe we go for a beer and you ask me questions because I think I'm missing the point. There you go, my application is back, it's up and running, but if I go to honors and I do find honors, I should be right here, right? So my name, the data, the application, everything is up and running and is working and I think I'm running out of time, right? This is, it was uh, 3.50 is the end of the, okay, yeah. Well, that, that was it from my side. Uh, I hope you enjoyed my demo and everything. If you have more questions, please, Slomo, let's, let's have a beer and, and I'll answer all your questions. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Miguel.